All right. So um, I thought we could start off. Um, Jacob, do you want to share the PowerPoint screen? Behind the scenes, we have Jacob, who's our awesome UWSP student worker, and he's going to be helping us with some of the tech stuff because I thought for this first um, tea and tapas, I should be able to lounge back in my chair and have tea and not worry about it. So this is um, part of the Wisconsin Center for Environmental Education, um, particularly the LEAF program. And we're going to be talking about observation outdoors and building respectful relationships. And you can go to the next one. But before we get into that, um, I thought we'd start off with a little fireside chat, like, uh, you know, Roosevelt style. But now we have visuals. And so Zach's um, got his fire roaring over there. And uh, he's also made some tea for this uh, fireside chat, tea and tapas. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your tea there? Sure. I'm pulling it off the wood stove right now. And what I have here is some hot water that I put some uh, Northern Wark white cedar in. And it just, I'm letting it steep in. You don't boil tea, right? You pour it on you, you let it steep in. And, you know, I, I'm kind of a, uh, I sometimes call myself a dirt ball or whatever, you know. I, I don't mind if it, there's a couple needles in here. So I'm gonna, I like to chew on cedar every once in a while. It has such good healing properties. It's, it's one of the four sacred plants used by the uh, Ojibwe in the, in the Kanabe. And, uh, you know, doing a little research for this, there is a warning. Of course, all of these peas maybe not uh, uh, necessarily recommended by the FDA uh, or the, the health program, but they say drink maybe a cup a week is quite good for you. If you do more than three cups a week, there are some toxins in there that can build up. But as far as a, a, a immune builder and booster, it's a very lovely tea. I don't even add honey or maple syrup or anything. It's quite sweet to start. And the aroma that comes out of it. One of the things that Native Americans use with northern white cedar is they, they burn it, they smudge it. And for you teachers, they say if you have a rowdy kids uh, or a, you know rowdy young people burning and smudging the cedar and having a little aroma smoke coming, it calms them down. So that might be something that would be nice to have in your classroom especially these days. So it's a lovely tea, the Northern White Cedar, and it's native to North America. Um, and it's quite fascinating little history with Europeans. Um, there's some documentation that shows when the Europeans came over, they were really sick and they were ill. And the Native Americans gave them cedar tea and they got better and it was scurvy that they were so sick over and it's actually the first tree to be transplanted to Europe, the new world, because it was such a powerful healing plant that they, they brought it back with them. So a fascinating. Wow, that's crazy. I didn't know it was one of the first trees to make its way over the other way. Lots of stuff was coming this way. But... The new world. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. I also have some uh, white pine tea, which is a similar process, um, really high in vitamin C and vitamin A. And you also made me want to bring up that um, I just want to do an indigenous land acknowledgement. You're up north a little bit, um, so closer to different tribes. Um, but here at UWSP, it's kind of the middle ground between Ho-Chunk and Menominee ancestrally, um, and that we are occupying um, those ancestral homelands and those folks were taking care of the land back in the day. They're taking care of it now and they, they will for lots of generations. Um, and it's really important to me to include this. So thanks for also including that kind of history and legacy in, in your tea too. Um, and speaking of, that's a great segue because I, oh, I forgot to share, I, for the tea and tapas, I had my pine stuff and there's, we're gonna send you links in a Google um, doc for all the stuff that we're telling you about today. Um, just so you know, 
it'll be all in one place in a Google document. So you don't have to worry about keeping track of it in the chat. Um, so there'll be like how to prepare tea and things like that in there. But I also made these cranberry um, walnut scones because it's tea and tapas. And so that's my contribution to this tea and tapas in addition to the, the pine. Um, cranberries you can get around here. There's a bunch of cranberry bogs. I got these cranberries from the co-op. So um, the quote that I'm about to read, you can, you can judge me and the walnuts are also from California, but had I been on the ball in September or October, there's a bunch of walnut trees around uh, in most of Wisconsin. And so anyway, I just wanted to share this little story and then ask um, Zach another question for our tea and tapas uh, fireside chat. And this is a chapter from a book called Brady and Sweetgrass. Um, that's by one of my cool mentors, um, Robin Kimmerer. And um, the chapter's on the honorable harvest and she's going out and collecting some leeks and gathering them and um, kind of does a poetic introduction. Um, but then she says, whether we are digging wild leeks or going to the mall, how do we consume in a way that does justice to the lives that we take? And so as we're thinking about tea and tapas and where things are coming from, um, the idea of the honorable harvest is something that I wanted to bring up in our first tea and tapas edition. And Zach um, is a trapper and has a lot of interesting connections. And we're gonna talk about the Martin eventually as a species of special concern. And so Zach, I just wanted to ask you um, to kind of talk about what you think about biocultural stewardship and building respectful relationships outdoors. Yeah. So my my background is, is kind of interesting and I, I think about how I was influenced as a young person and um, I can't run away from my, my family uh, because just like a lot of our influences, uh, it, it's usually a family member or a teacher or a mentor of some sort. And I was so blessed to have a father that worked for the Department of Natural Resources um, out of Mercer here in Iron County. And he was a farm boy from Iowa, Northeast Iowa. And he loved roaming the creeks of Iowa and he got this appreciation of, of the wilderness and wild spaces. And if you think about Iowa today, the, the old Iowa my dad used to roam with the horses is no longer uh, uh, current today because there's, there's fields and fences and private property everywhere and he wanted wilderness and so he moved way up north here and as a kid growing up I was exposed to so many different things exposure I think is so critical for kids and it was trapping my, my mother says uh, I fell out of the canoe uh, at like four years old um, and I sunk right down to the bottom and he went by and grabbed me as I popped back up. And we were on the muskrat march, trapping. And over, over time, we have, uh, as a family, have trapped over 30 years the same march oh, over I, and over again. I don't want to interrupt, but did you have some slides that you wanted to show with this too? Yeah, please. All right, so Jacob, if you could throw those on. And I'm just going to have a bite of my scone. I taste tested yeah. it earlier. But... And we're, we're, it's kind of fascinating, the, the Wilsons. And, and uh, you're sitting here in my home, which I built uh, with my father and my wife and my uh, friends here in northern Wisconsin. And it was, it was these influences that I think shaped me throughout high school. Um, and when I graduated high school, I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. I was a C student, but I was really good in the woods. I knew how to trap. In fact, I didn't go out for spring trap season because it was the beaver trapping season and I was going to make money. And uh, we, we did it through, through uh, exposure, but my father taught me, and this goes back to that harvesting idea of always respecting the land. You don't catch an animal and you throw it around and bang it and you you don't waste it you use every part of it and you um, respect the the harvest and the area you're you're uh, trapping at because you want to go back there next year so if i went and i trapped all of the beaver out of the lot which i could very easily do 
there wouldn't be anything next year. And so it's that renewable resource. And, and trapping can be controversial um, in this day and age, especially the market has really plummeted. People don't wear fur much anymore. And we have this discussion in our family about what is more environmental renewable resource than fur. We use cotton, which is uh, one of the most environmentally terrible things to grow. It's really heavy on water and pesticide and herbicide. Nylon products are made out of petroleum. And, and yet here we are, we have fur. Wisconsin has this bountiful resource of fur and, and we need to wear it more. We need to respect that resource, harvest an appropriate amount so there's some year after year and it's not bad for the ecosystem. And, and we need to pass that knowledge down and it's probably the reason why I became a naturalist and wanted to teach people is because I have those experiences. And in order to be a successful hunter and gatherer, you need to know the ecology. I need to know what the beavers are doing at what times of year. So it's kind of this fascinating thing. And you know, on the, on the left here, you can see my son next to a, <laughs> it's actually a dead beaver. Um, I have the same picture of me when I was that age, propped up next to a beaver in the house. And my mom would go crazy, of course. Um, but I, I think exposing kids to these things is just super important. Okay, I'm giving the, we had a special call between the two of us, um, but now everyone's gonna know. It's a coo coo coo, um, because oh, yeah. we only Thank have you. an hour. Um, and so these stories are awesome. Um, and I, um, I'm hearing a lot about intergenerational importance and making those connections. Um, so I'm not sure you probably had more slides and you can go through them, um, but maybe just finish it up in a few minutes. Sure, next slide. And they're real brief. Um, this is a, a photo that was actually taken up and put on the cover of the Wisconsin Trapper Regulation uh, Manual. But here are three generations of Wilson but I wanted to point out the kid in the middle with the waders on. He is not a Wilson. And he is a kid that is at Mercer or was at Mercer School that didn't really do that well in school. He looked out the window more than he did his books. And I, he was just into all of the things that I did. And so we mentored him. And he later on went to the conserved school up in Land Lake and studied environmental issues. Um, he is one of the best hunter and trappers I know of in town. And I think mentorships are so important for kids, even though he wasn't even related to us. So I think that's really, really important to find a kid and find somebody that they can mentor. Next slide. And I think the premises, and I'll, I'll end with this slide, I think the, the bigger thing about my program and my history of teaching environmental education is that no matter what it is, just get them outside and get them to have this sense of place, appreciate where they live. And I can guarantee you in this little county that I live in, most of these kids have never been to Lake Superior, They've never been to this rock outcrop. They had no idea that this county had all of these things to offer. So I think a lot of our kids don't have these exposures um, that are right here in their back door. And I think if you just look, uh, it's in every county in this state. I, I'll end there for now. All right, thanks. And don't worry, we'll be going back to Zach a little bit later too. Um, but I just kind of wanted to open off with a, a pretty informal fireside chat. And we learned a lot about both Zach and some things on building those relationships and how they're built on respectful relationships outdoors. Um, so I'm gonna keep us moving along to respect people's times. Um, if we do run over, that's okay. We'll be recording it and you have to leave feel free. Um, I'll go through this real quick. 
Um, this is part of LEAF, which is Wisconsin's K-12 forestry education program. We work throughout the state. We do curriculum. Um, this is professional development. And you can go on to the next slide. Um, we have a lot of hands-on resources. Um, in relation to this topic, I'd check out the edible forest kit. We have like 30 trunks and kits. So just know that those are available um, and you can navigate to them um, on our website. And you can move along to the next slide. Um, and this series kind of coincides with the WDNR forest lecture tea and tapas series. So they were talking about species of special concern. So our February topic also has some of those ties. Um, you can find more information about that on our website, but just know that these kind of work in, in parallel. Uh, but if you miss one and you don't make it to the other, that's okay. All right, next one. Um, of our last um, DNR series, I really recommend checking it out. It's on our WCEE YouTube channel. So it, um, you, can, you can find that within um, our YouTube links, but particularly the little, why are species rare in Wisconsin and forest dependent rare species um, work really well with some of the stuff that Zach and I will be talking about a little bit later. All right, next one. And as um, you're thinking about, you know, building up these relationships, I just want to say that PLT tree as habitats, basically you find a tree and then you start observing it and, and questioning like, what is, what is that habitat doing? This is a great entry point. Um, that'll be in, in the Google Drive that we send you all. Next one. Um, and Part of this is thinking about eco-cultural calendars. Um, in another one of my worlds, I'm wearing my PhD hat. Um, and so my PhD has been on thinking about how eco-cultural calendars can help us tune into climate change locally. Um, but for your next one, we, I'm not gonna dive into this. I did this for all of January and it was super fun because I was paying attention to the white pine because that was my, um, tea that I was going to offer. And um, there was so many things to observe. Um, but try and, and find at least one species and do a tentative identification of it. If you don't know what it is, um, maybe have a sit spot um, and, and check it out in its seasonal round. Um, so go ahead on to the next one. And now we're going to dive into a, a leaf lesson and we're going to put a special twist on it, Zach and I. Um, I just want to say thanks to Zach for being game for doing this. I was like, hey, I think this lesson is, is pretty cool and it's on forest management issues. Um, all of our LEAF lessons you can find on our website. Um, so just follow the LEAF curriculum and this is going to be in the 7-8 guide. Um, they're all sorted alphabetically. You can go on to the next slide. I feel like I've been talking. Let me, let me take a sip of my tea here. Um, so the basis, one of the things that I really want to get across is that there's multiple voices when we're thinking about forestry and forest management. And we're talking about species of special concern in particular today. Um, and that's one of the voices that often doesn't get too big of a voice in our forest management decisions. And this is a really great leaf lesson that talks about that there's multiple perspectives. Everyone has different values. Um, you have different information that you're going on and you might be wanting different aims and have different beliefs and those have positive and negative impacts on society. Um, but I really think it's a great lesson to work through like conflict resolution and their modern day issues. So you can go on to the next slide. Um, this just kind of sets up um, what you would do with 10,000 acres and you can imagine if you're a paper company and you put your paper company hat on, you might have um, a certain, you're representing a certain set of beliefs um, and then you have different maybe factors. So you're probably into economics with the paper company and maybe you have some ecological and you definitely have social because you're employing lots of people. Um, and those values would, you can do a little analysis of how those values would impact how you would make a forest management decision. Um, and that's in this lesson. Um, you can go to the next slide. And the lesson that we have in our leaf guide is from 2001, which is pretty old. Um, but it's still really relevant because then I was reading the Society of American Foresters um, little newsletter that they put out in August. 
and there appeared this, this um, article, Vindication, Rare Bird Drawn to Managed Forest. And it reminded me a lot of our leaf lesson because it's this um, management issue where they want to do more cutting because certain um, bird species like, and uh, lots of other species really like young forests. Um, but then there's people that are pushing back because they say that cutting is bad for water and various other things. You can go on to the next slide. Um, and so it's kind of like a critical literacy lesson where you look at who's involved. Um, in this case, you have the New Jer Jersey Sierra Club and the Sparta Martin Mountain, and they're um, wanting to stop logging that's planned. Um, and they're talking about drinking water, carbon and soil. So you can see right there, it's quick to do uh, who and what are, is this thing about? And then you can go on to the next slide. Um, and then you have other people that are saying, hey, we should do this cutting. There's bird species that increase from that. Um, we've done some research studies and we find that there's like bird species where there didn't used to be. And one of those bird species is the golden winged warbler, which is also featured in the, the leaf lesson guide. Um, and so we wanted to do a simulation of a golden winged warbler and 10,000 acres here in Wisconsin. So you can go on to the next slide. Um, and when I, I started telling Zach about this, that was kind of a long-winded introduction. Sorry about that. Um, we, he's like, oh yeah, that's, that's something because that was happening out in New Jersey. But he's like, oh no, that's still something that's happening here in, in Iron County. Let me tell you about that. And he does work with the Martin. Um, and so the Martin likes older habitat that um, should, it needs years and years and years to grow. Um, so it's later succession. And um, that would be not working well with it, new cutting. And so there's a, there's a controversy now, but not too big of a controversy about what to do with 10,000 acres in Iron County. And um, the, the Martin has some issues on that um, and viewpoints on that, that issue. And so does the, the um, warbler there. Um, but Zach, I'm not sure if you want to add anything of more details. You made this map for us here. Yeah, so once we started talking about it, um, I also have a background in birding and I've done some bird banding uh, under a, a master bird uh, bander in the area here. And uh, I caught a golden wing one and banded it. And um, once we've done some surveys throughout our county, uh, we've identified a few of these areas where we actually have golden wing warblers. And I've led birding hikes there. They're just a beautiful bird. Um, and, you know, it's interesting if you look at this map on the left here, I kind of just threw a few things in there, species of concern. So we have the martin, which is um, a state endangered species. We're, we're, we're talking the last endangered species. In Wisconsin, we've restored wolves, we've restored fishers, we've restored all of these other species. But the martin is that one that's hanging on there. We're trying to learn about it. And you can see in the kind of the heat map in the center of the county there uh, of places where I've found martins. Uh, I've also, in those same areas, found the northern goshawk, which is a species of concern that likes those older forests. But we've also have a pretty healthy population of golden wing warblers in the far north, uh, along Alder Creek and the Pinocchi Hills, and in some young aspen, some young forests. And so I guess my point is, you know, looking at land bases, if you diversify your forests, you can have all of these different things. And so when you come up with that question, what do you do if you had 10,000 acres full? You know, here's an example of what we do here in the county. We look at all of them. All right, let's go on to the next slide. And we're going to have some special guests come in um, to talk a little bit more about this issue. But it's interesting because there's a lot of different perspectives, and each of those perspectives have their own set of values um, and voices represented at the table. So you have paper companies that, you know, really are supporting the golden winged warbler, for example, because um, but cutting new habitat is beneficial for them. It's beneficial for the communities that they're employing and it's beneficial for the golden winged warbler. Um, 
or you have uh, wildlife biologists or Sierra Club folks that are like, wait, we don't want any cutting. And then you have DNR folks that are like, okay, I think we can do this balancing act. Um, but as we're thinking about that, put on one of those um, perspective hats and think about what you would do with 10,000 acres. And I'm going to turn my screen off just for a sec. And then we're going to have some um, special guests to come in and talk to you about it too. Oh, goodness here. I think we could stop sharing our screen. Hola, buenos dias. Uh, estoy aquí y me llamo Goldie, y, um, soy un golden ring warbler. Oops, I forgot. I'm down in um, Central America-ish uh, because that's where I make my winter home. And I am just plum tickled here to talk to you about this forest management issue. Uh, I am in quite danger, if you didn't know. And uh, it's because there's not enough new forests. You can imagine I, I build my nest on the ground and I uh, really want grasslands uh, so I can build my nest on the ground, maybe have a shrub next to it. But all those trees get a little bit intimidating when I'm trying to grow up and, and feed my babies. Like, wow, can you imagine having to eat insects only? That's a, a tough job. So insects are so, there's so many around in those newly cut areas. I just wanna promote forest management decisions that do this this new cutting. Yeah, I, I'm from Minnesota. And uh, my, my relatives are, are actually uh, also uh, youpers, eh? Yeah, we're going out to the deer camp and we're gonna sniff around to see if there's a dead deer carcass around there somewhere. Uh, I'm really endangered in Wisconsin. There's there's maybe only about a thousand of us running around here, eh? and uh, I, I like a, a little older forest, but more importantly, I need a lot of wood. I like to have a coarse woody habitat everywhere, a little trees to crawl up so I can chase those squirrels I like to eat up to the top of the canopy, and I'm pretty good at climbing and jumping around, eh? and uh, I really like small mammals mice, redback voles, but hey, I'll eat anything uh, fine. It looks good to me. I like grouse even. And once I even, uh, I found a gray jay nest in Iron County where I ate it, eh? uh, it, it. It's really interesting that I don't mind living next to that aspen with that, my buddy, the golden wing there, he, he stops by or she stops by and sees me every once in a while. As long as she keeps feeding me some small mammals like mice, uh, I, I can live next to, next to her. She's well, got a real pretty call. You know, now that you think, I think about it, I like taking my babies kind of into the woods a little bit to teach them how to hunt when they're first, uh, first getting new. Uh, and sometimes I come visit your cedars and there's really interesting insects there that I don't usually get. Uh, huh, maybe that, that new cutting isn't such a good idea, just cut, 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 because I like some of the places you live too. Yeah, I really like the edge of your forest, but I, I would even, I'd probably cross it and get in there a little more often to, to get those yummy mice but I'm afraid when I get there because I have some enemies out there, some people that want to eat me. And so when I get into that young forest, I've got no place to hide. So if you could uh, just have a few more uh, brush piles on the ground, I would really like that. I can sneak in there and eat some stuff, but I sleep in a, a cavity, a tree cavity at night it keeps me nice and warm up here in iron county it's so cold you know we're the deepest snow in the whole state and I, I like that snow too i can crawl down in it and stay warm make myself a little fort but uh i i can't go out there because the fisher and the bobcat and the owl might eat me uh yeah we have to think about all these things <sighs> These, these forest management issues are complicated, but I am just so appreciative to get the chance to speak and, and have a voice at your forum today. Sometimes that doesn't happen. 
you can see that I'm almost disappearing just as it is. Oh, that was a virtual joke that maybe wasn't so funny given the topic of this conversation. Um, but I have to run, so I'm gonna go. Um, and Mr. Martin, I'm not sure if you're gonna stick around, but time flies when you're having well, fun. It, I, it's I, quite don't, out. I don't stay put very, uh, very well. I, I'm kind of a hyperactive creature. I usually stay there for just a little bit and then I gotta keep going. My metabolism's so high, I gotta eat, eat, eat. We'll catch you later. Um, so hopefully you liked hearing from the um, Martin and the golden wing warbler. If you could go to the next slide, I'm just gonna adjust, I have weird light coming in. Um, you can see this is, um, some stuff from the DNR and we put all these links again, just in one place. Um, so if this is something that you're like, oh, that was kind of a fun little issue. I could do that with uh, my students. That's great. Um, the DNR has lots of great information. And again, there's that here from the expert series too. Um, but look at all those habitat similarities. So it's not an either or, even if sometimes that's the way um, things are portrayed. Next slide. Um, and again, I really think this is a great lesson for, um, there's a lot of different controversies going on nowadays and just teaching some of these skills that, hey, context matters. If it was the last um, Martin in Wisconsin, probably we'd wanna do more and um, to protect that particular place um, versus thinking about 10,000 acres. Uh, maybe you have minimal information, so you don't know like, well, actually, I don't know enough about the Martin or the golden winged warbler's habitat. They're species of concern. Um, that's what we were hoping to bring you a little bit of. Um, experience and knowledge manner, reaching consensus. And there's lots of other discussion points that you can um, go from on there. Uh, this is a hard time to get participation. So I was gonna maybe say like, hey, what do you think? You can throw that into the chat, but um, I know this is winding down the day for lots of people. So we won't have um, everyone uh, trying to rack their brains too much. Um, and so to segue from that LEAF lesson um, to more uh, Zach's work with Martins and students and how they intersect, um, I do have this podcast from um, some interviews that I took as part of my PhD thesis hat. Um, and it worked really well because it's on observations of change. So we asked people, you know, what have you noticed changing in your environment? Um, and then habitats and missing species. So for this, um, I also wanted to give like a little break in case you have like kids running around or something. This is just a podcast and we're just going to listen. Um, and one of the, the species, it's also a place to get in a book recommendation, but La Luz de, la, de Lucia is a great, um, it's in Spanish, but it's about the firefly, which you'll hear about in this podcast. So Jacob, if you could just play the podcast and I'm going to make my screen black and then just listen and and kind of think about like what it makes you think of um, as an educator um, and if you have feedback on that, so. Hello, welcome to the February edition of Tea and Tapas. We're gonna explore observations outside and building respectful relationships. And to do that, we're just gonna listen to a couple stories from interviews taken from the Backyard Phenology Project in Minnesota. And one of the main themes that came out of those interviews of hundreds of people which is missing species. So in this first little story, we're gonna hear from Erin and a relationship that she built with a tiny little critter and how something about him or her helped her notice broader changes in the seasons and cycles. <laughs> okay, yeah. we've got, well, we've been doing some brainstorming uh -huh. um, and I have this incredible memory of being a child and being outside at night and just the sky being lit up by the stars and then the field being lit up by fireflies and just the, like everything that's romantic about like a warm summer night and I noticed two summers ago when I was home visiting my mom that there were no fireflies and I said something to her, like, well, what's going on? Haven't you noticed this? And she's like, oh, no, I didn't notice it at all. With a tiny and last summer, same critter, thing, no fireflies. Helped her notice and we're actually staying with my parents right and now. Cycles. And maybe like four nights ago, I was outside and I saw one lone firefly. Mm -hmm.
Erin does a really good job of painting this picture of a species that she had a connection with and then it was suddenly missing. Vivid memories that she no longer encountered. And you might be thinking, oh, I noticed that too. Or why is that happening? And a lot of folks I've been talking to have been pointing to habitat as one of the big things with missing species. Because of the impacts on their habitats and uh, really on climate suitable habitat, um, you're seeing a lot of shifting of population. So we're going to turn to Katie and Gail and learn a little bit more about a species that they've been noticing missing, the meadowlark. But before we get into that, one of the fun things about this story is really getting to know Katie and Gail and how they built their relationships to outside. Here's Katie, who we heard from a second ago. Getting started, kind of getting bit by that research bug, I got a chance to make the outdoors my office and was able to be a part of conservation biology, that research going out and doing population distribution mapping of uh, grassland birds or looking at how um, deer populations and uh, grazing cattle up in the Black Hills of South Dakota affected elk populations. I know my friend Gail here. I, she was actually my, my first supervisor uh, when I came to work and volunteer at the Rafter Center. And Gail. My grandparents were farmers. They were small farmers in northern Minnesota. Um, I, all my life I've wanted to be outside. Yeah, every, every part of my life there is something to do with the outdoors and that's how I associate with the world. And Katie, of course, <laughs> and I got to know each other at the Raptor Center. But we do a lot of stuff together. We have a lot of commonalities. So now that we got introduced to Katie and Gail, let's hear a little bit more about the missing species that they identified, the meadowlark. So I'm older than Katie. <laughs> and certainly uh, with my grandparents' farm, being on grasslands and wider open areas, species like meadowlarks. I not only heard my grandparents and my aunt and uncles, but I also noticed that you don't hear them, you don't see them. Um, you do definitely notice changes in not only the things that you see, but as Gail said, in the things that you hear. And I would say the meadowlark is definitely one of those key species that um, that growing up that we were both used to, to hearing. And um, because of the impacts on their habitats and uh, really on climate suitable habitat, um, you're seeing a lot of shifting of population. Our number of species, um, even here in Minnesota, that many different bird species that um, we're now through collecting data, both uh, in the summer when the birds are breeding and in the winter time that we're seeing over time, massive shifts northward of, of where we're actually observing these birds. So we have suitable habitats moving and shrinking, missing species, changing relationships, and fundamental losses in what we see and hear. That can get a little bit overwhelming. But lest we head down an anxiety tunnel of hopelessness, doom, and gloom, which is actually real, um, and be careful with with students, um, let's hear from Gail and Katie one last time, just to put these changes and our own agency into perspective. So change is part of being on this planet, and that can be a very, very good thing, um, but not when it is coming at this rate or as far as, as being driven by humans. Oh, that's great. Oh my gosh, we could talk for an hour. <laughs> um, it really, it's amazing. Um, you learn so much about the world that you're in and about the different kinds of uh, natural and human impacts that come into play when it comes to conservation. Um, but what I love about the path that I've taken professionally is that I'm able to take that that love and that passion and all the things that I've learned out in the field and bring it to the community at large that you know when you when you take everything that you've learned and you're excited about it I think it makes it easy to to share that and to start that fire with people that maybe haven't had the same opportunities to engage and to to take in and to learn you know about these natural places that we that we share. I thought Katie did a good job of kind of summing things up. And so I just want to leave you with an idea of how you might connect to different species and natural places and how you might start the fire for other folks in your community. And maybe do one last reflection on this missing species voice, the meadowlark.
All right. So um, that was kind of a podcast kind of audio thing, because in using multiple voices, it's also important to think about multiple mediums as ways to connect with, with students in particular. Um, and so that's been kind of a focus of like, hey, let's get some different voices in here. Um, and we we made some appearances with the Meadowlark and the Martin that hopefully you liked. Um, and this is a transition to more of Zach's work that is super inspiring and talk about lighting fires. Um, I think we can switch over to, actually, let me see if there's any other slides that I've forgotten. I don't think so. Um, but we're gonna transition over to hear more about Zach and his um, work that he's done, because it is- Hello, welcome. Inspiring. Whoops. Um, all right, I remembered correctly. Um, and thanks for being such a stalwart navigator there too, Jacob. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Zach. Um, and if you have questions about anything that you've heard or seen today, um, feel free to shoot me an email. And again, a lot of the stuff that will be that we've talked about will be in that um, Google Drive. I just need a screen share ability from the okay. host. That's easy enough to do. Navigating this virtual world has been uh, very interesting for us educators. I'm sure the teachers in the room absolutely know uh, what I'm talking about. Um, I run a program, um, it's 20 years old now, and uh, it's, it's a program that uh, started in collaboration with the Nature Center and it started in uh, collaboration with um, wildlife biologists. I just need to move oh, all of the Zoom things are in the way for the button to push to start my slideshow. We all understand. Another part, another part of. Okay. Ah, there you the, go. The program. The program that we started uh, 20 years ago was was trying to get like a, a, a wildlife practicum or a forestry ecology practicum um, to get kids outside to get them to learn different skills and and you know even though these little towns that live in the far north you think they would be uh, well versed in dressing for the outdoors and snowshoeing but in a way some of these communities are just like an urban area where kids don't have those opportunities to get outside. And so that was part of the, the initiative was to get kids outside and, and to focus around a species, a charismatic species that would get their attention and want them to go outside. Um, sometimes forestry can be kind of mundane and boring because the trees don't talk, they don't move. Well, that we know that we can hear. <laughs> but, um, you know, having it in collaboration with a charismatic species um, and we started off with the fisher and we studied fishers. We caught them and radio collared them in collaboration with the DNR. And then we followed them around with radio telemetry. And it was just fascinating what the fisher taught us. And then after so many years of doing that, we, did, we weren't really contributing to science to the, the biological community. So we were asked to switch to American Martin. And that was a state endangered species, still is. Very little was known about them. And they are in the same family group, the weasel family or the Mustelidae um, family. And they have similar characteristics, similar uh, behaviors, uh, but slightly different habitats. And so we started this program and boy, it was just an exciting thing for me. It, it was actually started by my father and stepmother, believe it or not. And it's followed me throughout my entire career from when I was a naturalist at a nature center to my conservation job here in Iron County. Uh, my title is a conservation specialist. And we budgeted uh, with uh, funds from the forestry department to get kids outside and teach them forestry and ecology. Um, and I know this is a super unique program and it's not going to be something every teacher can run off and do or find somebody to do with their class. But I hope there's some things in here that you can maybe relate to or, or grab from here as ideas. And, you know, one of the basic things is to get kids outside. And 
I really worry today, and it's it's I'm a parent. I have three children. I worry about the amount of screen time and the inside time and the, the disconnection that we're having with the environment. Uh, with just getting outside and play on the playground or in your yard. Um, and so getting kids out of the classroom and I would take them for half a day once a week. So it was a huge commitment from the school. Um, and we would teach them ecology, forestry, and just making those connections, those conservation connections. And from the beginning uh, of simple map and compass skills, tree identification, how to put your snowshoes on, how to measure snow depth, um, all of those really basic things to today where I have introduced technology, tablets, we do forest inventory now with a, a tablet. We can use map, a program called the Venza to, to show us where we are in the forest. We can put cover type layers of you know different uh, environments on this map so we can know if we're in a maple stand or a pine stand or a cedar. So it's been kind of a fun transition with some technology. Um, and, and the, you know, just by being out there in the community, word got around, we, we actually won a, uh, Governor Walker gave us a comeback champ, uh, award for citizen science, which is a, a kind of a buzzword, uh, has been for a while, but we're the state DNR is relying more and more on these citizen scientists to collect data, useful data, um, that is being used in our, our population analysis and and maybe harvest quotas for certain species. Um, and these are things that I think teachers could, could get involved with if you have a school for it. Um, uh, just a quick photo on the left here of a, a radio collared bear that we got to go into the den and work with UW Stevens Point on their bear research project. Um, just exposing kids to different things. Um, one of my big things, and it was funny, uh, Kate and Nicole have, have seen me on my soapbox. Um, there are publications. I've got a publication right here uh, written by uh, the DNR and uh, kind of revised in 1988. And it, if you look close on here, it says Pine Martin. And then if you look in the scientific to the Latin name there, Martis Americana. And one of my big lessons is we don't have pine martens in North America. So if you've heard people say pine martin, pine martin, we actually don't have any. Uh, they're a European species uh, found in Europe. We have a, a variety of different uh, uh, martens kind of subspecies from uh, Alaska to the Pacific. But we here in Wisconsin have martis americana for the American martin. And the reason why I say that is I think having the wrong terminology or the wrong common name on species can really be misleading in that, what do you think of, what kind of forest do you think of when you think of a pine martin? What do they live in? You would think pine trees, a pine forest, white pine, red pine, when actually we're finding them in cedar, hence our cedar tea today. So uh, I think it's misleading. And so from now on, you can use Martis Americana or the American Martin. And, you know, if you think about fur bears and species here in Wisconsin, we had a really rough history from the fur trade all the way up into the early 1900s where we extirpated many species. The fisher was extirpated. The Martin was extirpated. Bobcats and otters were in trouble. Beavers were in trouble. And, and we have to take a moment every once in a while to celebrate the wins that we have, where we have restored almost all of those native species, except this Martin, which we're still learning a lot about and struggling with a little bit. Um, but uh, we, we can't forget to, to, to celebrate our wins. The other neat thing about um, the Martin, and just like the cedar, uh, it's one of the four, cedar is one of the four sacred plants uh, by the Anishinaabe, well, Martins or Wabaseshi is a clan animal. So another Native American connection here in Wisconsin. And those were the warriors, the hunters, the providers. Um, and you, you can 
tell why they were considered a clan animal as a warrior by their attitudes. They're really unique creatures. And I have a little short video here for you. They're, they're very cute critters, but uh, quite vicious, and they are considered a warrior, and I can see why. The entire Mustelidae family, weasels, uh, mink, uh, otters, um, fishers, all, all of those species have an attitude. And the largest of the Mustelidae species, which we don't have, is the uh, wolverine and you can just think about that attitude uh martin too. so uh I, I wish i could share i have hundreds of slides and I, I i gotta keep my time limited here so i'll share with you some highlights of our project and then at the end maybe brainstorm some ideas that you could take and use in your classroom Oh, and I just wanted to say too, um, if you need to leave early, that's okay. And then Zach, if you need to go longer, totally okay as well. Um, again, this will be recorded. So if you have to um, go a little bit early, you can always catch it on our YouTube channel. So feel free a little bit with time. You won't, you won't offend me. Um, I was told I had a, sh a short period of time, but then when I shared my slides, they said, oh, oh, but share them all. So uh, just go longer. So I appreciate that flexibility. Um, and these are all photos that I took or the students took, um, students learning how to use radio telemetry. Uh, but I didn't wanna just go out there and wander around in the forest. Uh, I wanted to actually collect some real data that can be shared in the, nat in the scientific community. So we, we talked with uh, our friends at Glyphwick, which is the Great Lakes Indian and Fish and Wildlife Commission. We talked with our friends at the DNR. There's a Martin Committee with, bi with uh, doctorate students from Madison and Purdue University. And it, they were so nice to invite us to the table to share some of these findings that we have. And, they, and we kind of tossed back and forth some research techniques. Um, so while we're out there following this Martin around, we, we would identify what kind of habitats they were in. And they're cavity nesters, as I mentioned early on, but not all the time. And so 41% of the time, I'm sorry, 31% of the time, we actually found them in the ground resting. And I think a lot of that has to do with Iron County and snow depth. Uh, snow is a huge factor when it comes to Martin populations. And if you think about where they live in North America, they're in the Rocky Mountains and Sierra Nevada, Canada, up to Alaska above the tree line. In almost all of those situations, snow was a factor. And so we think of uh, maybe part of the survival or struggle of Martins has something to do with snow depth. So that's something we're looking at. Um, the, this slide here is really fascinating. It's the accumulation of several martins that we've caught and captured in this one about uh, maybe a, a 80 acre block. And if you just look at the dots here, and the colored dots represent different martins that we've captured over the years, occupying the same home range. And um, this uh, is wetlands. This symbol in the background here, this topographical map is a wetland. And it actually turns out to be a northern wet music forest where there's cedar as the dominant tree species. And northern wet music forests are also places of concern. Um, we call more like ecosystems of concern. They're becoming more and more rare. Um, and then the, the upper, the whiter part here on the peripheral is northern hardwood forests. And then you have these hemlock patches here and there. And so you can clearly see the Martins told us something. They taught us something, that this is where we like to live. And it wasn't just one animal. There were four or five animals that taught us the same thing. So we're, as we're going through this project, we are starting to see patterns come up. And, and we needed enough data to, to make it somewhat of a, a strong case to say. 
uh, what kind of habitats they were living in. Uh, this is a cool photo. We walk up and, and martins are, are curious animals, a little different than their cousin, the fisher, uh, where we rarely saw a fisher during the day. But turns out the martin does move during the day a little more often than the fisher does in our study area. So we, we often got to see the animal, which is quite amazing. Um, we also documented some uh, unreported into, into incidental trapping, which um, is a factor when you're trying to build a population up um, and from just a handful of, of species, uh, we want to know, are there trappers catching these things incidentally? And so we did have one of our collared animals actually um, get caught in a trap incidentally. Um, and the, the, the Martin story is very complicated. And I, I uh, recommend that you, you maybe have it as a class project to look up this endangered species that we have here in Wisconsin that's struggling. Find out their history. Uh, many of them were relocated um, from Minnesota and the UP up in Canada in British Columbia. And hence why I had that accent earlier, um, my, my poorly done Minnesota Uper accent there. Um, so it, it's just a fascinating story. Uh, we did have a couple of our animals also um, get predated on. We had a one here on the left, we found it half eaten. Uh, we couldn't quite figure out what species uh, killed it, but it could have been a, a hawk or an owl or a bobcat, fisher possibly. And we even had um, one of our martins killed by porcupine. Quills, uh, we found it dead with quills in it. Uh, we had a couple really remarkable uh, things happen. And here we are in northern Iron County, way at the very top of Wisconsin. And, you know, here we're, we caught one Martin and then that led us to another Martin and another one. Over the, the 10 year span of doing our radio telemetry, we caught 15 Martins and put radio collars on them. And this kind of shocked the scientific community a little bit going, hey, there's something happening here in Iron County. What is it? Is it the forest management? Is it food, prey availability? And one or two of the, the martins that we caught um, had a microchip in it. And one of the things we do when we catch a martin, we put a radio collar in it, is we put a microchip in it. Um, in case the collar falls off, we will still be able to identify the individual. And so you can see on the left here, our little scanner here, two of the martins that we caught were actually from the release the original release, so they were caught in Minnesota, brought to Clam Lake, Wisconsin, released, and they came to Iron County. And one of them actually went all the way over the dots here, from where it was released to Iron County, all the way up into the UP, which was uh, one of the first times we documented a, a west to east migration happening with the relocated animal. So here we are, just a bunch of kids and a, a conservation guy wandering in the woods. And we're actually collecting cool data that's being used uh, in the scientific community. We even partnered up with Purdue University and we put out these hair snares uh, where there's a bait and a wire brush with a Martin's crawl in this tube here on the right and brush off a little bit of their hair, which we can use for DNA analysis and we can do a bigger population survey. So that was kind of cool to use hair and DNA in the project. Um, more recently, we no longer uh, capture Martins and put radio collars on them, um, but we haven't quit looking for Martins. We're just doing it non-invasively with these incredible new technologies of trail cameras. And so now we're putting out bait stations and cameras where we're looking for individual color patterns on their orange throat patch. So we can identify individual animals based on the unique throat patch that they have. So uh, it's a fascinating thing and DNR is really taking this on and they're doing massive studies now that's giving us a lot of information about where these animals are and where they're not 
and where they're moving. Um, if you're not familiar with a state program called Snapshot Wisconsin, um, it's possible that your school, if you have a school forest where you could get a Snapshot Wisconsin camera and put it out at your forest and uh, participate in programs like this, free of charge, and they're constantly looking for more places to put out cameras. And then your students can go and look at the different animal species that the camera catches. Kind of a, a cool way to add data to the state program and learn about science. Um, another thing that we've recently done is we, we kind of got a pretty good idea of what modern habitat is. But one area we miss is the food, the prey availability. Why are they choosing these cedar wet music forests? What is it? Is it the habitat? Is it the cover, the resting sites? Or is it food related? And so we partnered up with this gal doing our master's study at the University of Oregon. And we did a quick little small mammal trapping program with these Sherman small mammal traps. Uh, and I think with a, a little bit of research, um, you could set the same kind of thing up on your school property or even in your school grounds, looking at what kind of small mammal species that you might have around your school. But we looked at it in relation to different habitats or what we call covers. So you got a hemlock cover type, a cedar cover type, a northern hardwoods, and we had another the fourth category, Northern Harvard with Canada U as an understory, which is a whole nother story. That's a really rare uh, ecosystem. And, you know, doing this quick little survey, we found that all of these small mammal species were telling us something. They were telling us that cedar is important. Cedar is important. Cedar for flying squirrels, cedar in total, mixed with hemlock. So of course, Martins are in these ecosystems. That's where their food is. We have not tested uh, Aspen clear cuts or young forest, which I think is, is a, would be a neat study as well to see what kind of prey lives there with the golden wing warblers. Just another quick example of how important that ecosystem was for these species. And, and by the way, the, the animals or the, the students are out there with me collecting this uh, data. They're using forest tools like the angle gauge to study basal area. They're using a uh, canopy uh, app on a tablet to see how uh, thick the canopy is, what the gaps are in there, how much light. They're, they're measuring the coarse woody habitat in a hundredth of an acre plot. And so you can use math to figure out the, the distance of the string for the center of your plot, and you can figure out what a hundredth of an acre is. You can introduce math into research techniques. Um, and, and you can kind of start to put this story together, or we did anyway, of how important um, habitat is for these animals. And we, we talked about golden wing warblers and martins and how they can live together. And you can see this lower map here where here you have clear cuts mixed in with cedar, and here we have a Martin location. The critical point in, in what we've learned to where we can transfer this information onto forest and wildlife managers is that you can have both. As long as you don't make island populations, make sure there's places where there are corridors where you can have movement of, gen of genes, genetics, from one area to another, or movement from one habitat to another. So that's a really important message that we've learned. You can still have forestry and deal with this state endangered species. They, they're not something where you, you can't have one without the other. Boy, the cedar key is good. It's been a long time since I've had it. It's kind of sweet. The, the other thing that I think is really interesting, and it's changing all throughout Wisconsin, and I encourage teachers to get a thermometer out their window. There's some really cool digital thermometers now. We're right there in the classroom. You can monitor 
the effects of climate change or and make a, phen a phenology chart of where uh, it was last year at this time for temperatures and look at trends. Because for us in the north, we did that and we're seeing an overall decline in our snow depth, which we think could be a big threat for uh, our Martin. Um, and that's just simply measuring snow in a standard location. Um, really important to talk about natural resource careers. We expose our kids to live timber sale operations where they can learn about this new equipment that's being used in our forest. We can learn about measuring forest volume, uh, scaling trees, and how important that is in Wisconsin when it comes to jobs and our economy. Iron County has less than 6,000 people as full-time residents. And we need forest income to help offset our taxes. And so we need this beautiful marriage between our recreation, our wildlife, our endangered species, and our forest industry. You can't have one without the other. Um, and I, I'm almost done here. I'm just thinking some of this stuff is really a unique program. It's been an honor to be part of it. Um, but, you know, what are some of those things that as a school teacher you could bring to your classroom that kind of has the similar benefits? And I say that because my program, it's, it's been uh, 20 years now. And there are students that I have, have had as, as uh, participants in this research project that are now professional natural resource biologists. And that is so cool as an educator to see a student progress and be influenced by something you did and pass the puck on kind of thing. Um, so it, it's such a neat thing, but you know, what can you do? In my opinion, right now, it's just to get kids outside no matter what it is. Observe that tree, as Kate mentioned. Follow it over the course of the year. What's happening to it? Are there insects on it? You know, um, you could get involved with some bird things. And I, I like um, educating stuff on, on av the avian world because birds move. Uh, they move to your classroom or, or to your school grounds. Um, and there's some cool programs called the Great Backyard Bird Count and Project Feeder Watch, which provide really cool curriculum that you could do to, to learn about bird populations. Um, I don't know why more classrooms that don't have a window don't have a bird feeder out there. Yes, it might be a distraction, but utilize those distractions, learn from it, build a, your curriculum from it. Uh, you could do things like bio blitz, which maybe examines your, your school forest or your, your playground or your, your school grounds. They're looking at many different species from insects to um, worms to you, you name it. Um, wildflower hunts, I thought would be a neat idea to, during the springtime. Look, trying to identify the different plants growing in your yard uh, or playground. Project Worm Watch is another one, identifying invasive species, learning about their threats to our ecosystem, and then teaching them how to remove them. Climate change in the classroom, I think, is really uh, a big thing these days. And I, I love this idea of having students do an energy audit of the classroom and maybe the school. Where can you save money? Turn off this light, maybe make close the shutters at the end of the day, that kind of thing. Leaf collection, tree ID, um, pollinator gardens at our school. I think we need to wild up our schools. They're sterile environments in so many ways. Talk to your administrators and your school board and find an area where you can turn that schoolyard into a outdoor classroom. And we all know with virtual the world we have right now, kids need that outside connection. Um, and then at, with my uh, Wisconsin Conservation Land and Water hat on, there's a really cool program called Envirathon where they have a, a 
different uh, categories that you learn and then you compete at a state and national level. And we also, all, all of your count, all of the counties in Wisconsin have a conservation department. And we offer uh, a, a conservation poster contest and a conservation speech contest. And I think they're really good for kids to learn about state conservation issues. Lastly, just get them outside. If I didn't say that enough, have an experience with them. My uh, year has been totally flipped like many of yours. I'm doing smaller, lesser outdoor experiences with masks. <laughs> Um, and I, I, this upper right corner photo just scares the heck out of me as an environmental educator. All you have to do is go anywhere and look at these kids and they're glued to their phones. And I think if we can provide some experiences, diverse experiences where they can put that phone down for a little bit, we will be better off. I am more than happy to answer any questions. I know we're we're out of time. Here's my contact information. Drop me an email. Uh, call me. Um, I love to brainstorm different creative ideas. So um, feel free to reach out. And I, I know I went long, but I hope, Kate, and those that still stuck on, um, you enjoyed and, and learned something about our program. Awesome. That was so great. Thank you so much for your time. And also, thanks for being willing to like um, experiment with theatrics and other things. Um, Nicole had had a question a ways back, way back when we were still drinking tea, um, and if there was a best time to harvest the cedar tea. The greatest thing about evergreens and, and conifers, or I love uh, an old forester told me to use the word conifer instead of conifer, because then you get that connection of cones as their seed source. The great thing is they're green year round. You can do it year round. So that really important source of tea is available year round. New buds, new growth is gonna be the freshest, the sweetest. So you can actually, when you go to maybe harvest your white pine or a balsam fir, if you, if you pluck the new freshly soft green needles. They have a little more flavor to them. But this thing is an old dried up cedar branch that I took uh, about two weeks ago, and it tasted just wonderful. <laughs> Actually, I think one of my favorite parts of your presentation on Martin's and all your work, which was so cool and awesome. Um, and if people have questions, um, totally, you can unmute yourself and ask them, um, or you can stick them in the chat. Um, but you were like talking for a while and then you needed a drink and you had a drink of your cedar tea and you were like, man, that cedar tea is good. good. Uh, and so that might have been my favorite part, even though there was lots of awesome tidbits in there. Um, well, and you know, for all of you all. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, I do uh, presentations here and there um, at like the I did it once at the Wisconsin Lakes Convention. Um, I'm doing a, a big presentation at our Wisconsin Land and Water Convention. So you can, um, and I think you can get the whole thing on YouTube. That's right. It's on our Iron County Land and Water Conservation Department's YouTube page. I have a full audio, the entire Martin Project on there, recorded. Uh, let me, I'll get that link from you because then we can put that in that document. You can share yeah. Absolutely. And there, there's one other uh, really, I, I was, I've was i done this so long, I've just really been blessed. I had a, a film student, like a wildlife documentary film stu student, call me once and just said, I want to just follow you around. And he made a 20 minute documentary on the project called A Man for the Martin, which I can share that link. It's on Vimeo. It's actually pretty cool. Um, and he did it free of, of charge. Um, really, really talented uh, film artist. And, and, you know, those are the things that kids can do too now. I'm not saying don't use technology. Introduce it. Um, 
and have them do a film of of anything outdoors and then they can kind of combine those two environmental and technology i think those are a win-win because kids really really enjoy both of those great yeah there's a lot of um cool options and opportunities out there and i think you did a good job of maybe some of you were like what kind of ride am i getting on tonight um but hopefully we've um sort of made a full circle with thinking about stuff that we're consuming um and how it relates to habitat and species of special concern um, and then kind of looping in what what you can do as an educator or as a as a person in this world that um, has to face kind of forest management decisions every day even if you don't think about it <clears throat> um, do we have any other questions that are out loud oh and melissa actually he was um mentioning the energy audit kit and so i'm putting you on the spot if you want to I mean the energy audit, and if you want to say anything about the energy audit kit, feel free. Um, if you're still live, oh, I'm live. <laughs> yeah, thanks for uh, mentioning that. Yeah, um, teachers can check out. We have kits through the Center for Environmental Education, and uh, yeah, it's one of our kits you can check out. There are light meters in there, watt meters. Um, what other good things? Infrared thermometers. You know, kids love running around with something that has a laser on it. Um, so yeah, they're super wonderful and you can use them indoors and outdoors, which is pretty fantastic. So yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for recommending that. Yeah, I, I love those ideas. There, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, so I hope it, I hope it worked. Good one. Yeah, I, I mean, I think missing species is awesome. And so, um, if there's not any last questions, um, which I'll make kind of a, a gathering exit here in, in case you think of something. Um, but our next Tea and Tapas is coming up. You should join us for that. Um, and that's on fire and succession and maple syrup and outdoor memory. So it should be a good one. Um, Zach, thanks so much again for coming and sharing all your work and wisdom. And it was really fun prepping and thinking about costumes and things like that too. So 